Hi, everybody. Um, I'm having a little difficulty getting my video started. So there we go. I'm actually sitting in a car right now. So I apologize for that. Um, I wasn't able to get from one destination to the next destination in time um, for the meeting today. So I do apologize for that. Um, I did want to take this opportunity to welcome everybody to the Resident and Family Support Council meeting um, that we hold on the second and the fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, and we do these at three o'clock. And as all of you know, because you all got into today's meeting, um, this link never changes. So please feel free to share the link for these meetings with um, people that live in nursing homes, work in nursing homes, as well as have somebody that they love that lives in a nursing home. We really wanna make sure that, um, that these meetings get to the eyes and the ears of those people who really could benefit from these meetings. Um, the purpose of our resident and family support council meetings is to make sure that we empower people. We want to empower people with information. So today we actually are going to take this opportunity to talk about engagement and what engagement should look like. Um, so we want to take an opportunity to be able to do that. And so with that being said, um, I would like for anybody to feel if they would like to contribute to the conversation to please go ahead and do that um, because we really do want to make sure that everyone can talk on this subject because one of the things that we've noticed is through um, the pandemic um, you know a lot of engagement had to stop right uh, because we had to quarantine in rooms we had to isolate so we weren't able to get out there and engage like we previously were able to engage so we're starting to see as the ombudsman program that people still are maybe not be that comfortable in coming back together and that may be facility initiated with them not being comfortable with people coming back together or it may be individually initiated where people may not feel that comfortable so this conversation today is really to talk about what engagement is all about, why it's important, and why we need to be able to pursue um, getting involved in life um, and really living life to the fullest. Um, so just because we live in a long-term care facility doesn't mean that having meaningful life engagement needs to disappear. Um, so what is this thing of engagement that it is that I'm talking about? So just to start this conversation off, I'm going to share um, what engagement really can mean. Engagement is very individualized. It's self-defined. What might be work for some people is actually enjoyment for other people or may be considered leisure for other people. So what some people may not enjoy doing, like for example, with my husband and I, I love to do yard work. I like to garden. I like to um, work in our outside area and my husband can't stand that stuff. So for him, that's work. For me, it's enjoyment. And that's where, where it's, that's why we, when we talk about this, it's very personal. It's very self-defined. Um, so with that, this engagement that we're talking about, you know, we really want to make sure that people truly understand that they get to define what engagement looks like. You get to personally define what that looks like for you. And so I actually am by trade. I'm a recreation therapist. And as a recreation therapist, we really do look at leisure and at that time of enjoyment as being where the time where you get self-fulfilled again. And like I said, so for some, it may look like work and that may not, they, and work may be enjoyable to them. And for others, it may be work and not enjoyable for them. So part of this, part of this conversation that brings us to this today is making sure that you have that life worth living. Um, Dr. Thomas, who is a founder of a movement called the Eden Alternative, um, where um, you bring life into long-term care communities so that they can um, thrive by bringing plants and animals and, um, uh, and energy into a long-term care community um, is his philosophy. And he had this belief that people were dying of plagues in long-term care. And those were three plagues, the plagues of loneliness, helplessness and boredom. And if you think about that and how that affects us, many of us who don't live in long-term care huh. even experience some of that through this pandemic. She's we, in her car. 
I'm going to go ahead and see that we need, I'm going to mute. Okay. Just want to make sure that everybody's muted. Unless you have something to say, then please, um, you can go ahead and raise your hand, and I can make sure that I, um, I that we get you unmuted. Um, so that loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. What is that? Not having people around that you want around, right? That's that loneliness piece. And some people may be perfectly comfortable being by themselves through the majority of the day. So just because I might be a social person and someone else isn't a social person doesn't mean that I should push on them what it is that is important to me. So engagement shouldn't look like in long-term care where everybody's gathered together in a room and that's the only opportunities I ever have to engage. It should look like people doing meaningful stuff that's important to them. And if that meaningful stuff does require a group, a group comes together. But simultaneously, if I'm not a group person, I should be able to do something outside of that. I should have that opportunity to do something outside of that. And that may look like I might want to be in the room, but I might not want to participate. Or I might want to be in the room and I just might want the noise around me. But what I really want is to be able to sit in the corner and read. Or I might want to sit in a hallway and just watch the people go by. And that can be my engagement. So it really truly is very, very self-defined. I'm actually going to open this up a little bit. Um, and Candace, I'm going to put you on the spot right now because you, I see that you have your camera on. Candace is the regional ombudsman for the Evanston, Illinois area. And I the reason why I'm going to put her on the spot is I just saw her puppy come into play. Ah! <laughs> Here it goes. Look at him. So Candace, can you tell us what meaningful engagement looks like for you personally? As you say, I do think that sometimes we force groups on people. Um, and sometimes, like you said, they like to just watch the world go by. Um, but also, you know, speaking of puppies, just some people really like animal therapy and some people don't. So I just noticed that when I see animals back in the facilities after COVID, it's just so meaningful for some people and it just really makes their day. So, you know, sometimes we have to bring the outside world in. And, and that's when we when we bring a puppy, because like I could not, as you know, I could not live without my puppy. Um, but like we said this morning at our other meeting, sometimes we have to go into long term care and we don't have the choice to have our own puppy. So to have somebody bring in animal therapy, I think is just so important. I, and that is, I agree with you wholeheartedly, which brings me actually I want to share a video with everybody because, you know, we talk about what meaningful engagement can look like. And I just wanna make sure before I do that, I wanna make sure that I copy it in case I had it all ready to go. So I wanna make sure that this works well. I wanna, can, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I wanna share this video with everybody. And this is gives an illustration about what meaningful engagement can look like. Great. Okay, it's okay. There's enough for everyone. There's a wild new method to regrow okay. bone and get rid of osteoporosis, and it's starting to spread like wildfire. If you deal. Okay. We are always looking for new activities for our residents that bring depth and meaning, and of course, also joy into their lives. Neonatal kittens need around the clock, 24 hour care. They need to be bottle fed every few hours. And we just simply can't do that at our shelter. We don't have 24 hour around the clock staff. We have a super skeleton crew at the shelter. So we rely exclusively on foster families to do this kind of work. So without Catalina Springs Memory Care stepping forward, these little kittens might might not have made it. She, uh, she thinks I'm her mother <laughs> somehow. And, uh, but no, she's a wonderful kitten. From the moment I came out to Catalina Springs Memory Care to take the photos that have been all over the internet, uh, this was something really special. It was the most beautiful and touching account of what we do because seeing the, 
the residents light up, seeing them recall memories from their childhood, seeing their family members sort of weeping in the corner at the beauty of the moment. This is this was by far the most special thing I've ever been involved with with Pena Animal Care Center. And when I think back to when I started three years ago, the good news stories we were telling were about, you know, hey, we're saving pets with broken bones. And this is like the next level for us. This is us going out into the community and not only benefiting the pets in our care, but benefiting people. So this is like by far the most amazing professional experience I've ever had. I just love cats and dogs. Beyond the fact that they survived when they wouldn't have without Catalina Springs Memory Care stepping forward, um, they've received so much touch and socialization here at the center that they are going to be the most well-adjusted, perfect kittens uh, in their forever home. So with everyone, I mean, when you see the residents holding them, it's so touching, but it's also really good for the kittens to get that constant interaction with people. These kittens are gonna be what we call bomb proof. They can go anywhere, they can do anything, they can live with anybody because they're gonna be so well socialized. You're a big baby. Hmm? You're a big baby. You are, you're a big baby. So I just, I would just like a reaction from anybody. Um, if someone could give me a reaction to that video. <laughs> And what that video, what message did you get out of that video? Well, yeah, I'm going to jump in here. Tell me if you can hear me, first of all. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So this is what is important for our loved ones. Um, you know, a lot of people think that animals have to be therapy animals to go inside of a facility. That's not correct. Talk to your directors. Um, I have three dogs. Every one of my dogs has been in my son's facility literally from the day we brought them home. They all went to the facility before we came home so they could get used to being that bomb roof that they talked about. Um, so they're not phased by the wheelchairs. They're not phased by anything else. Um, my son's facility routinely does a fall festival that brings a petting zoo. And the guy has goats that are trained to walk on leashes. So for the residents that won't go, come out, I take the goats through the building. There's so many ways to engage and get them all happy. Animals, babies, you know, it's kind of like, you know, like a baby. Either way, people are thrilled to see them. Bring them in. Let them love on them. And Candace, I think you have the same dogs as mine. Oh, my gosh. I love what Carrie just said as well, that they don't have to be therapy animals. Like uh, all of the f uh, facilities I've talked to, they just say they just have to have their rabies vaccination. Um, of course, you know, you want to know your own dog and make sure that they wouldn't scratch or bite or if they're teething like my puppy. But definitely, I know, I think I've said this before in one of our groups, but um, one of the facilities I used to work at had a therapy chicken. So thinking outside of cats and dogs and, and just knowing that we're in Illinois and just some of these people might have grown up on farms and just to bring that back to them uh, in such a way, as we talked about this morning, getting to know the person, what kind of memories would a chicken bring back? And that could be a whole meaningful ac activity in itself is to talk about, you know, memories that the chicken brings up or the dog brings up or whatever. I mean, we can just milk it for more than just one visit. It, it can become, you know, so much more than just a visit from a dog or a chicken. Absolutely. I mean, we look at those plagues that Dr. Thomas of the Eden Alternative talked about loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. And, you know, this is just, we're looking at kittens right now. Kittens, something extremely simple um, to bring into people's lives. And, um, and it's, it gives that meaning and purpose. So not only is it that benefit of having that other living being that you get to connect to, but it also starts giving purpose in the life in life again. Um, so I, I want to just think about that for a minute. How does it feel to not have purpose? You know, has anyone ever had those days where you wake up in the morning and you don't have much going on in the day? And you're like, well, what am I going to do with myself? And you get very lethargic and you don't know what you want to do and you can't, you know, you just don't have a plan out there. And sometimes those days are welcomed. But when those days become every day, then it becomes, why am I getting out of bed? Why am I not 
what, what I, I have no value. I have no meaning. I've got nothing going on in my life that I have to do. And part of this is, is people need, we are needy be, beings. And that doesn't have to be that I am engaging with a kitten. It could be that I'm in, that I've got a bo good book that I'm reading and I want to read that book. It could be that I have a computer game that I really like to play. It could be that I like to do arts and crafts and I want to do arts and crafts. It could be that I like to listen to music. So it's very, very varied for each individual. And what we want to continue to have through this conversation today is where we don't get stuck in this pattern of long-term care um, facilities that do a program at 10 o'clock and two o'clock every day. And that's what the activity calendar can look like. Donna, did you wanna say something? You can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I work as a, uh, I'm a volunteer ombudsman. Oh, great. And um, so for the last four years, I go into the nursing home multiple times a week. And since COVID has ended, the activities are not what they were. Um, there's a huge staffing issue everywhere. And it seems like they use the activity staff to do everything else, like bring people down for dialysis or you know, to the door because they're leaving for a doctor's appointment. So nobody's getting activities. And when I tell them that they need to have you know, uh, people eating together if they want, uh, they have to do these activities. They claim they're doing them, but, but they're not. And like our hands are tied because IDPH comes in. And if, you know, they happen to be uh, passing out a book that day, then they don't see that they're not doing activities. They say, yep, everything's fine. So it's a tough thing. So uh, the one thing I did bring up to uh, one of the places that I go into is a, is a dog. And so they're highly, they're very much considering getting a dog for the facility. And I think, and I don't know for sure, so I wanted to ask, do you think, recommend that the dog should start out as a puppy that's going to live at the facility and maybe, you know, go home with staff on a weekend here and there for doctor's appointments, stuff like that. But can I jump in on this? Because <laughs> we've been through this one. The dog, so if her dogs to live in a facility, the dog really needs trained first. Yeah. Okay. Where you, yes, it can be exposed to that facility on a regular basis, but it needs its potty training, its discipline, its yeah. Key How do you do it? Crazy. Yeah, they're just so, puppies are too crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, you have to find somebody like usually. In the facilities that I know that have had a dog, um, that way, usually either the director or somebody um, takes the dog, has it at home, works on the training, and brings it back and forth. Um, my husband and I were going to buy a dog for my son's facility, and it just never, because of the type of facility we are, it just wasn't going to work, but that was going to be our thing. We were going to take it to all the training we were going to formally train the dog and you know take care of all those things but also bring it to the facility as a puppy all the time yeah so because it has to learn everything from the most important thing you can teach a dog that goes in a facility is the word leave it because if they walk past and somebody just drops a pill you've got to be able to say leave it and they don't touch it right so it's as much for the resident safety as it is for the animal safety. Um, it's not quite to the level of training a service animal, but there are some similarities. Um, if you want, have Lee or somebody give you my information and I will at least give you some direction. Yeah, I would love that. There um, is, the Pioneer Network has done a lot around this concept of bringing life, bringing animals into long-term care facilities. And um, one of the recommendations that they do make is that you also keep a chart on the dog. So every person that lives in the building has their own record, you know, their own personalized individualized record um, that has when they got there, you know, they go to the doctor and all that stuff. Do the same thing for the dog. 
the dog should have a chart where when they go to the vet, what medication, or did they get their heartworm? Did they get their um, rabies shot? All of those sorts of things so that you know that you're all good to go there. So that if he's going to, you know, be a part of that facility. Um, so that's one thing that I can, I know is a recommendation from the pioneer, um, pioneering group. For, for those of you that have done it, do you have, because one of my concerns was that you can train the dog, but you can't train all the residents. So, you know, people are going to be wanting to feed them, um, things they shouldn't have. How do you work around that with seniors? Well, you typically don't allow them in the dining room during meal time. Yeah. But they um, have stuff in their rooms. Right. Exactly. And, and it, no, go ahead, Carrie. About training the residents too. I mean, my son right. is in a building with 49 adults with developmental disabilities. And sometimes it's not even just what you don't want them to do. It's also knowing that Susie is petrified of dogs and you have to keep oh, the dog right, away right. from her or she's going to panic. Um, and right. we have that in our building. I know I walk through that building with an 85 pound, eight month old Rottweiler regularly. And I know what residents I can take my dog near and what I can't. So it really is training everybody. And one of the things you try, you know, as you're working with the staff and the residents is, you know, how do they deal with the dog? How do they approach the dog? You know, make sure that they learn that you just can't reach out and grab, you know. Right. So it is a training thing for everybody. My son's building used to actually have a resident that had a dog that lived there for years. And the resident cared for his own dog. So they like always said they do love that. animals. Yes. yes. And not everybody does. I think that's right, but most of them do. I found. Yes, yeah. and yeah. I've also seen what has worked um, in my previous um, jobs that I've done. I've been in buildings that have had animals, and there was um, one place that I went that I used to go to all the time, and they had um, it was their dementia neighborhood, their dementia um, community where everybody lived on um, the wing of the facility, and um, they had a dog there. Now this dog was previously a show dog and he was old and retired from being a show dog. So he was very well disciplined because of that. And um, so his owners were like, he's old, he needs to retire. So what a better place, let's have him go live with the older people. Right. So he actually lived there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this dog lived there. And it was just one of the most beautiful things because when you came into that wing, the dog knew if you were not a person that should be there, like that was lived there or worked there all the time. And he would he would bark when a stranger, like he would if it was his home. He would bark when a stranger would come in and then he would come up to you, sniff you, make sure you were okay, and then, be, and then welcome you to the facility. And you would find him on the day-to-day -day basis laying in somebody's bed with them, taking a nap, cuddled in their easy chair, uh -huh. um, by people's feet. Um, he was just a part of the community life there. And he was an older dog. And yeah. it worked out very well for them. Part of it is- I thought about seniors too, senior dogs. I think senior dogs would be better because honestly, puppies, you can't, like mine is teething and it hurts me. But when you think about senior skin and they just, that's just a, they have to right. chew. So, and their energy is just too much. And there are so many senior dogs that get looked, people don't I really know. Get. So I, I know. think it would be kind of a great message because it's like, look, we're not forgetting about you and we're not forgetting about these senior dogs. I think it would just, the energy is. A I lot love better. that. Yeah. I love that. Yes, seniors because adopting does. seniors. Yes. yes. I've adopted a senior before. Yeah. And I, I love, love them. Did you have something you wanted to share? See, your hand is up. Yeah, Lee, one thing, um, another thing to consider, um, somebody mentioned that you don't need necessarily a therapy dog or a service dog, but there are dogs that don't make the cut that are yeah. trained as service dogs. And so they have a lot of training and a lot of skills, but, but you know, maybe they bark too much or maybe, you know, for some reason they're not chosen to continue on in the program. And so um, applying for one of those animals may also be a really good option because they're typically 
really well trained. Now, if you don't stay with the training, they don't keep it up on their own. Um, I've learned that personally through a relative who um, got one of these um, dogs, but that would be another option of um, a pet that may be, you know, very well or easier to acclimate, I guess, to facility life. Mm -hmm. right. so the biggest issue today with this is going to be, no matter how wonderful of an idea it is, you're going to have facilities telling us, we don't have time for this. We can't keep our staff. Yep. You know, we don't have enough staff to you know, take care of our residents. How are we going to make sure the dog gets walked? Yes. Which is, you know, which is to the flip side, why if you could have family members that will work with the facility to have the facility comfortable with bringing their dogs in when they come to visit or find a volunteer program that will do this because there are lots of them a touch programs and such because staffing right now whether we want we like it or not is going to be the issue of a roadblock now more than ever of getting facilities to do this and it is not it, it is not the facility's responsibility to care for that animal yes. um so that has to be very clear that if an animal is going to be there that the res if like if a resident is having an animal assisted livings um i know assisted livings will allow cats to live there and small dogs but the but it cannot be the staff's responsibility yeah. to take that dog for a walk or to clean that kit cat's litter box it has to be the individual's responsibility to be able to do that now if you have a staff member who wants to step up and do that sort of stuff on their breaks that's perfectly fine but also as a um as a, an acting administrator in a building that I worked in, um, we had a, um, a a dog that would come in and it was a staff member's dog. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I would do as the administrator is we also had a gentleman um, who liked to go for daily walks. He wanted to be outside. So I would take him and the dog both for a walk at the same time. That and we would have a laugh because we would ground up both of us with this puppy and him and he's in a wheelchair and we would get all tangled up with each other and we would just we created more memories for each other and that's part of what it is that we're talking about with engagement today engagement should not just look what can i do to keep people busy because mm -hmm. if you notice we're not saying about busy we're talking about meaning and value mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be busy busy doesn't make people feel good busy yeah can make people feel worse yeah they 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 are not f feeling fulfilled so that's part of what to think about as well when you are going to approach what that program is going to look like for your facility well and as we talk about engagement you know we have to look at what is important to your resident is is um bob a cardinal fan and we need to make sure that he's in front of a TV before every Cardinal game because he can't always get the TV on the right channel himself. Or is, you know, Eric a concert person? So we want to get him on YouTube and help them find the things they need. Because like Lee said, engagement is different for every resident. And you really have to figure out what that is based on where the, le the level of the resident is for their own enjoyment you know Donna, they're not you, there Donna. just to get through 24 hours a day they need to enjoy life Donna, I think, you, yeah i do yeah i think can you hear me yes yeah okay i think that whoever said purpose hit the nail on the head everybody all of us need purpose um i'm retired i do the ombudsman because it gives me purpose and these people in the facilities have lost their purpose for the majority of them. And so it is, like she said, either, you know, let them get lost in a, a, a baseball game, a football game, um, having their nails done, maybe bringing someone in that would do nails for people or the dogs or the cats. I mean, we just need to get them engaged and then through, I think, engagement, they do find purpose because they start thinking, oh, well, you know, they're expecting me. And so then they'll go, if not for themselves, for their friends or for the staff. So I think it's so important to have activities available for them, things to engage in. And I mean, I, if I were yeah. younger, I would get a dog and just take it with me every time yeah. I went. 
I think Donna, what you're saying is so true because, um, you know, I was just in a conversation last week with um, a community ombudsman and she was sharing with me this facility that's had a tough go of it. And one of the things that they've decided to do is to empower their residents to plan their activities and lead their activities. And that is phenomenal because talk about meaning and purpose. So one of the things that they're doing is they're doing a dance party on the patio oh, all day long. They're having dance parties. They've got a guy who's a DJ, one of the residents, goes out there with his music and they're just dancing throughout the course of the day, enjoying oh. music together. Now to me, and that takes zero staff time to do that. Right. Um, also we're saying that they, um, they're doing more like resident initiated. They wanna work. A lot of these right. residents want to work. So they're looking at opportunities they can have for that, help set the table, help. Um, I used to be in a building where they gave everybody hot towels before their meal, which was a great thing to do. It was, a, it was an infection control thing, but it also made them feel like really great um, before the meal to have that nice warm towel. So they, one of the ladies um, that lived on that in that um, unit, she every day rolled those towels and gave, put, put them in a basket and then staff would put them into the warmer. So they had them, they only were starting it for dinner and they wound up doing it for every meal because she just, and it was her job and nobody was taking that away from right, her. Right, right. And everybody got to value her every single solitary meal saying thank you to her for doing that for everybody who lived there, meaning and purpose. Yep, So yep. let me give you a suggestion for facilities. So in our facility, my son and one other resident rotate every week at the new hire orientation. And they use them to train people how to do transfers. They use them to explain to the new staff what it's like to live here, that this is my home, not, and we ask that you respect that, you know, and don't come into my room at 3 a.m. with your phone blaring music. And so, as, and we, they did it a lot before COVID. They're just now going back to it. And I can tell you whether it's the staff who have sat through an orientation or my son or the other gentleman, they have gotten so much out of this to be part of the day-to-day -day of knowing what's going on. And it makes a huge difference for the staff to hear from a resident what it's like to live in a facility and those type of things. Those are great ideas. And yeah. I, I'm thinking, I'm trying to also think of things that could be offered to the residents that are in bed that are not mobile and they really need a purpose. Like I have a lot of those that are very together cognitively, but physically they don't have the ability to get up and walk around. And if they had like stuffing envelopes, you know, or, yeah. Yeah. or, or like, invent something where everybody's birthday could be acknowledged and let some of the residents like make cards or something just something that they can do that gives them purpose while they're laying in a bed right because they want to be busy well, we need that candace you just said yeah you're speaking my yeah for those residents you know uh, like the facebook portal and and the different chat video chats that you can set on their bedside table so they can video conference with whether it is their family member or somebody that's down the hall it's learning how to use those things to your advantage i mean we live in that world we have the technology why are we not and it is i will never say it replaces visitation because it doesn't and i will say that was my last dying breath but there is a purpose for it and it can be a really good purpose Yes, absolutely. I agree. Candace? Yeah, I was thinking, Donna, like when I was an activity director, it was always like, because, you know, our budgets were tiny and, you know, it really did take a lot of creativity. And I was always trying to think of how to get more bang for my buck, like even talking about therapy chicken, like trying to ride that thing to as many activities as I could. And, you know, our bed bound residents, um, that wanted purpose, it's, uh, I started this group in a period at a period care called art for the good. And it's like the same call, the same picture that you would call her for free for no reason. Why can't we send that to homeless children? So every month they pick a group that they want 
their pictures or cards to be sent to. Uh, and I, I have contracted with a facility, well, not contracted, but like I made a covenant with a facility. I will take the cards every month to wherever, like whatever they decide that month they want to, for instance, co connections for the homeless, or we have like a, an orphanage type thing in our area. Uh, all I ask for you to do is keep the art table stocked. And so I made that agreement with them. If you stock the art table and make sure that they always have supplies, then I promise you, I will do the legwork. I will find the, you know, so, and, and that's something as an ombudsman, you know, we can have the luxury a little bit more time for little things like that. And then right. the bed bound residents feel like they're not just coloring in bed because how often, and we know this, do activity directors say um, 2 p.m. art class, and it's really just them handing out pictures. That's to right. Color. So what, so fine, if they're still going to do that, then let's harness that. And, and we infuse the meaning with the residents and, and ask them, where would you like this to be sent? Because boy, they don't want to be forgotten about. And right. it helps them feel, like you said, accountable, because then they're like, oh, no, I've got to I've got to make this card for the kids or, you know, like birthday cards or uh, unfortunately, there's always some sort of disaster in the world. So right. it's like if there's a, a hurricane Katrina, whatever it is, like, make some cards. I'll, I'll find somebody to send them to. And they just feel so good. Yep. And then it's, it's cheap. It's just the price of a card. And then a little bit of effort and creativity. That's a great idea. Well, and that. another thing to do with that card idea is um, I used to encourage facilities to send cards to the people who went out to the hospital, who were in the hospital and had that made by the residents, had the residents be the people who are making these cards and sending them off to their friends that are in the hospital as they would do for any friend that they had to sell a get well card. Um, and so it's another thing that we, that, you know, that could be done. And again, we're trying to think of things because understanding this, the, the reason why our work group decided that this was an important conversation to have is because we are recognizing that staffing is an issue. Mm -hmm. we're recognizing that priorities have changed in COVID, whereas that's not okay. We still, quality of life is extremely important. If you've got quality of life, quality of care will happen because relationships start to develop with people. So if we can focus in on how can that quality of life look even though I'm having staffing difficulties right now. And like I said, that really empowering residents, let them plan your activity calendar. Activity calendars do not have to look pretty. They have to feel good. That's the important piece for the people who live there. They've got to feel good for the people who live there. They don't have to be pretty. Um, and they don't have to be for compliance issues because there is no compliance issues besides meaningful engagement. There's nothing that says you have to do an activity at two o'clock, that you have to do an activity at 10 o'clock. You can do an activity at midnight if you've got people that are up at midnight. You can do an activity at, at six o'clock in the morning if people are awake and need to engage at six o'clock in the morning. Um, so it's really taking a look and making sure that you're doing what people need to do. And one of the things that I say, you know, because I want to bring that conversation to how can we empower all of us that are on this call right now to make sure that those individual needs are getting met through your engagement. And so I, I want to know ideas on that, how people can encourage for all of us that are on this call today to make sure that people are listening to me so that I get my engagement opportunities that I want to engage in fulfilled. Any mm -hmm. ideas on that? So Lee, I, and I was a little late to call and sorry, I'm outside and there's a semi going by. Um, but um, it, kind of thinking back to the, what, what people were saying about writing cards. I, I had a woman, she, she passed away right before COVID and she was effectively a quadriplegic. I wanna say she had very late stage muscular dystrophy I can't remember what her exact diagnosis was. She couldn't speak, uh, but she could move her hands just enough to write on a, it was, it was an electronic slate. I can't remember what it was exactly, but it looks like an iPad, but it, it writes like a, like a slate. She could write on that with her finger and she would write poetry and write prayers. Oh, wow. And, and then there were there were people from her church that would then take that and um, put it 
put it on cards and send it to missionaries and churches and people all over the world. And so every year at Christmas time, she was just getting flooded with all of these cards. Um, wow. And, you know, when she was in, in her final days, um, you know, she was getting cards uh, from all over the world. And what a wonderful it, thing. Yeah. I worked at the facility that actually took the residents' artwork um, and they put them on cards. They put them on the cards. They had cards made up with the residents' artwork on it. And then they um, they did that as a fundraiser um, and they gave it to their family members for Christmas. For, oh, uh, for Christmas. No better gift than a handmade one. Yep. And they just, they got cards, you know, it would be like a box of uh, blank cards that you can get at the store. So every card was different because it was made by different people. So it was like 10 different cards that 10 different people had made. And it was just really a beautiful. And it said on the back, lovingly designed by the residents of ABC Nursing Home, which was a very, very cool. I love that. Yes. Are there that. any residents on the call that would like to pipe up? I would love to hear some from, from residents of what do you think of what we're saying or what what would your ideas be? Even if it's you, Bruce, because you used to live in a facility and we know you're here. Um, we got a suggestion. Go ahead, Bruce, you're gonna talk? What was that question? Bruce, what we're curious, we're curious what you would like to have seen when you lived in the long-term care facility. Um, what what sort of things you would have liked to have seen that would have been meaningful engagement for you? Well, we had quite a few dogs come in, uh, service dogs, um, probably three or four of them um, every week or every two weeks. And that was real nice. Um, it would have been nice to have a dog in the facility that lived there because uh, I would have played with it all the time. Um, that would have been really nice or a cat you know but the dog i'd be probably more better a lot of people are dog people um you know that yeah a dog would have been nice maybe a pet pig i don't know and there, there is somebody who made a comment in the chat about therapy animals and people that might have allergies to um to the animals and i know that this was again something that through the pioneer movement it was something that really um was brought up to a lot of conversations about that as well one of the things that i've been told and i'm not an expert on this area so i can only repeat what i've been told in regards to this is that the, the air filtration systems in long-term care facilities run very efficiently to purize 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 the air and so you don't see the pollutants like you would in a normal home um, for the allergy issues to be as prevalent now if you do have somebody who's extremely allergic I, I think that's something to be very cognizant of and needs to be part of that decision making process who is allergic and who you know could be around them who's going to be allergic and sneeze who's going to be allergic and have a very adverse reaction um, sometimes people are allergic and they're like I don't care anyway I still want to be around the animal I've got a niece like that um, who just is allergic to cats but she just loves them so much that she decides she's going to suck it up for when she wants to be around the cat. Um, but, you know, so that is, that's an important thing to bring note to. You do want to be mindful and know, and you want to talk with everybody. So you don't want to be making um, a choice of something that you think is a good choice. You want to make sure you're talking to everybody about this as you're going down that path, because we don't need to have any more homeless animals. Right. We don't need to get an animal and then for them to become homeless. No keep them anymore either they're so. responsible for them till they take their last breath if you adopt them yep absolutely yep. um other people were talking about schools and getting children involved in people's lives again this is part of um not having that experience where we're trying to be very holistic in what people's lives look like i remember when i went off to college i started craving wanting to be around little kids i felt like do little kids disappear off the planet or the earth? Because I haven't seen a little kid in all semester. And I was around children all the time. I was a day camp counselor. I was, you know, around children and I didn't see them anymore. And I was 
really missing it. So I want volunteering for Girl Scouts so I could be around these kids again. Um, but that is, I mean, you look at a lot of people that have had grandchildren um, that had their own children and having that void in your life of not having children. Um, my daughter shared with me last week, a Japanese nursing home that's actually bringing babies. They're recruiting babies into the long-term care facility for these people to engage with. And it's beneficial for the babies as well as it is for the people who live there. So again, thinking outside that box, what does that look like for the people who live there? Right. Candace, something you wanted to say? Whoop, you're muted. You're muted. Intergenerational is my jam. And so um, not everybody wants to be an ombudsman. Um, so, but, but we do have a need for friendly visitors. And a lot of the facilities are saying, you know, that they just don't have time for volunteer coordination or this and that. So if there's any way as an ombudsman, you can help facilitate that. So what I did was partnered with um, Northwest University, which is right down the street from a couple of the nursing homes in Evanston. And I'm providing um, just, just a little liaison to get them to the facilities so that they can have intergenerational time um, and it's quality time. So, you know, yeah, they could just do their nails, but as they're doing their nails, the whole point of this, um, it's part of their capstone project for college where they have to meaningfully engage. So it's not just passive and it's not just entertainment. It's true sharing of intergenerational um, experiences. And so, like you said, because when we're in any environment that is one thing, like older people or younger people, we miss, just like Lee said. And how I got into this was, oh, somebody's at the door, hold on. When I was, never mind. Anyway, that's, I'm good. Well, someone made, go ahead, Donna. I can remember intergenerational is my thing too. I love it. I, when my daughter was young, a toddler, and she went to like a, a daycare while I was at work, uh, preschool, um, they had a senior daycare at the same location that the uh, daycare for children was. And every day for an hour, they would join the seniors with the children and it was, I mean, you talk about seeing people light up and a lot of the kids didn't have grandparents either. So it was a win-win for both of them. So I love that mixture. And I've given the suggestion that as a long-term care facility, many of your staff member have children. Mm -hmm. Why not find a long, uh, why not find a child care center that's close to the nursing home that you might live at or the intermediate care center or wherever that may be and find one close and ask that place, would you give my, my staff members a discounted rate if I told them to bring their, their kids here? And now you're starting a natural relationship because the workers' kids are going to start to get to know each other. And then you tell the activity director, now let's bring them in for Halloween. Let's bring them in for story hour. Let's go there for um, the birthday party. Let's Let's start doing things together with each other. And it's not having to take on a daycare license as a long-term care facility. And it's not having to take a senior center license for a daycare facility, but it also can help bridge that gap for right. people to, to come together and be able to connect with each other of intergenerational ages. So there's some, again, let's go outside that box. I'm right. hearing somebody put in the chat. Um, Michelle is talking about a family council who wants to ask the local high school wood shop to do a Pinewood Derby race. That is sounds like so much. Yeah. Fun. Do you, Michelle, I don't know if you would like to unmute yourself. Some people are comfortable with it. Some people aren't comfortable, but if you'd like to unmute yourself and talk a little bit about that, we would I'm love here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sweet. Okay. So yeah, I, I'll introduce myself as a um, family council member from the Veterans Home in Montrose, New York. And uh, my co-founder Janine is on the call. You see her there. And uh, our high school is only about a, a mile away. We have... Um, so we have some pushback from, from our administration, but we are har trying our hardest to um, engage uh, in a meaningful way and help them with ideas like, um, you know, like this Pinewood Derby idea, which was originally like a 1930s Boy Scout um, 
project between fathers and sons. And we think that many of our, the oldest people, we have a really old census, a really old population in our nursing home that they would remember this, you know, they remember things from the days of old, not yeah. so much uh, yesterday. So, um, and, and if I have, since I have a, a moment, I'll just uh, say how proud and um, honored we are to work with our ombudsman in the tri-state area in, in New York. They are our saviors. They are always there for us. They're supportive. Um, our ombudsman actually comes to our weekly family council meetings uh, just to show support, to help with references to the regulations and just to, and, and gives advice, speaks one-on-one -on -one with anybody who might have a, a particular issue. So, so thank, thank you for asking me to speak. Well, Michelle, thank you for sharing that because what a great idea. And then see, this is what starts to happen. You start getting the energy of one person's <laughs> idea, right. another person's idea, and another. And so the next person says, bring the bring the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts in. You know, I know my son was a Boy Scout and they still did the Pinewood Derby. Mm -hmm. Why not do the Pinewood Derby in the nursing home? Right. What a great opportunity to be able to. It's Bring great fun. Together. I've told them it takes a, so little. It's a very small profile track. Um, uh, my my husband actually, you know, uh, uh, has a has a uh, local uh, bear club where they go. They meet have a meeting place, and there's one on the wall there. It's about forty feet long. It's never out of place. You know, anybody wants to get up and play it. I think it would uh, bring a lot of joy into a nursing home. Anybody who doesn't know anything about it, just Google it, and maybe we can start a movement. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephen. So yeah, I'm uh, an assistant cub master in in Quincy, and honestly, I had never thought of having uh, a Pinewood Derby in a nursing home. It just I don't know why it had never occurred to me. But that is a fantastic idea. And She's a genius. I, I can see infection control having an aneurysm over um, <laughs> bringing a bunch of people. Uh, and young people into outside, then. a large event, but on the yeah, patio. Out, yeah, on a on a patio or if there's a, a large community room, Mike, um, you know that it could be held in. Um, you know that uh, that could be a possibility. So. Well, Lisa said that she had a resident um, who was quite skilled at carving the painted blocks of wood into beautiful pinewood derbies. Elisa, do you want, do you feel like unmuting yourself and sharing a little bit more about what you experienced there? I don't know where Elisa is on the screen. I can only see so many names and I don't Well, see and I, I see Bruce and uh, Janine have their hands up. I think Bruce's hand was up first, I think. Not okay, sure. Bruce. Bruce, would you like to share? Yes, I tried to go back into the nursing home and visit people and they just wouldn't allow me to come back. So really? yeah, it kind of bummed me out. I went to people at ProMedica and they uh, wouldn't even let me go inside the nursing home. They got a new administrator because when I left the other administrator quit because there was no more challenge because I wasn't there. And uh, yeah, they, they wouldn't let me come in at all. See, and as somebody puts, sometimes it's, it's about leadership. Leadership is very important. Um, and they're invited to attend these meetings. If leadership wants to attend these meetings to hear it from people, we'd love that. Um, if they need to talk, to, you know, the ombudsmen are here to talk through people's concerns as well. So some administrators have concerns bringing people in. How can I do it? Well, then let's problem solve it. Let's go out on the patio. Let's make sure they're six feet apart. Let's make sure that we're doing it in a safer manner so that you, the people who live here can feel safer. But life is also worth taking some risks. Risks are allowed to be taken in life as well. We have to remember that. Calculated risks are okay. Did you have something um, that you wanted to share, Jeannie? Jeannie, yes. Hi there. I just wanted to introduce myself along with uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Along with being a co-founder of our Veterans Administration Nursing Home in Montrose, which is just below West Point. Um, and we started that three years ago, Michelle and I, just from a Zoom, just like this, where we met each other on the chat. She's in Sarasota, Florida. I'm in Queens, New York. Um, I am also the Family Council Liaison for the Long-Term Care and Community Coalition. So some of you may be, you may be uh, familiar with the LTCCC. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
because Michelle and I had such an amazing success and we continue to have an amazing, amazing success with our family council, which is about 118 people strong. Um, and as she mentioned, we have these weekly family council meetings. I am here, use my brain. I know how to form and find family councils and to sustain family councils. So if anyone is interested in my help with your family council, um, feel free to put your information in the chat. I'm going to put mine in the chat and you can contact me. Janine, if you could do that, because if that might be a topic that we want for another one of our resident family support council meetings. And, and, and forgive me, I know I'm in New York and Michelle's in Sarasota. We were invited to this Zoom by Janet Daniel, who is, um, she's has a, a mom in, she's in, in New Hampshire. No, she's in Alabama, but she has a mom living at Fairhaven, I think in New, in New Hope or New Hampshire. No, okay. New Hope, I think, New Hope, Massachusetts, I think is what it is. But she's fabulous. She's this lady with this fabulous Alabama accent who I met <laughs> about a month and a half ago, uh, talking to her about her family council. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, and that's what these meetings are about is to support each other. So I would appreciate if you would put your information into the chat because I may be reaching out to you myself because we, you know, our topics change every other week. And that's something that we have had interest in in the past is family councils. And it's always good to hear from people who have lived it. Um, I think that's very important. Um, Lawrence, I see that you have your hand raised. Did you have something you wanted to share? Well, I actually just wanted to respond to Bruce. Um, you know, if there's a specific resident who wants to visit, who wants him to visit with him, um, you can possibly reach out to, the, to us as the ombudsman, and we will advocate to make sure that happens. The, the facility should not keep him from visiting a resident mm -hmm. who wants to be visited. So yeah. reach out to us. Thank you for that, Lawrence. I think that's an important thing. I'm, 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 I'm surprised none of us said it to him because that is so <laughs> That is what we're here for. Um, and so thank you for reminding everybody, including um, ourselves, um, that that's something that we should be doing. Um, some other things that were put into the chat is about live entertainment. And I know we, I worked in one building where there was a gentleman who had um, dementia, but he was an, a fantastic piano player and he would play the piano every day during lunch for everybody. And then he wound up traveling to all the other dining rooms as well in the facility and playing for them because people are like, we want music during lunch. And so he really did enjoy that. Um, it was something, talk about value and meaning and purpose. Um, it was an absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal um, um, for everybody. Everybody really got to benefit that. So you don't know. Um, I worked in a build, another building where for Christmas, we had the staff put together a band and they were our entertainment for the Christmas. And let me tell you, they were just okay, but they were the best entertainment we ever had because everybody knew the people that were playing in the band and everybody was dancing, the staff, the residents. It was just a, 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 one of the best parties I've ever been to. Um, and so again, thinking outside that box and what can that look like? So Lee, you mentioned uh, Lawrence's reminder. And speaking of reminders, we are at time. Yes, we are. Yes, so we are. We just hit four o'clock right on the dot. It's like you've timed that perfectly. Um, so I want next month, um, and our next meeting is in two weeks, which the date for that would be, um, Stephen, you had to always give me the date. I do not have my calendar open in front of me. It's the 28th. 20. I can't hear you. It's muted. Um, it would be two Tuesdays. It's, it's the 27th. 27th. So on the 27th, three o'clock, same link that you use to get into this meeting. If you can't find that link, you can always go to our website. Um, and it's right there on the Department of Aging Ombudsman page. Click the Resident Family Support Council link. You'll see that link right there. Um, also, it's out on Facebook. I even put that adorable kitty video out on Facebook this morning for everybody because I thought I would get requests for that video link because it really is um, just something really special to share. Um, and we'll be talking about it at our next meeting at three o'clock on the 27th. We will be talking about residents' rights. Um, we're going to be talking about the consumer, um, uh, the consumer voice is a website and an advocacy group for people who live in long-term care. Um, it's a branch of the Ombudsman, um, National Ombudsman Association. And we are going to be walking through some resources that they have for residents' rights. Um, and we're not gonna be talking about the rights specifically, we're gonna touch on that, but we really wanna talk about how we can make sure 
our rights are being listened to. So that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to share some resources. And this is actually going to be done by um, by the Consumer Voice people. They're going to be coming on and joining us um, from, from there. So they'll be leading that meeting for us. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put up the poll. So please don't leave me yet until I get that poll up. Um, and I'm looking for it right now because I am in my car and this has been a very complicated meeting for me to run in the car. So I'm sorry about that, but okay. It's now not noticeable. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I'm, I'm telling you, I've had some challenges with this. So I'm going to, first, I'm going to stop the video. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, so here we go. I'm going to stop the recording and then I'm going to put the poll up. 